should Tottenham fans be happy this morning? Well, as you as you know, the January transfer window tends to be the window where people fix substantial problems and try to avoid something happening rather than try to encourage something to happen. So you can you can bring notable exceptions into the equation, but they are the exceptions. You can bring Suarez in that Liverpool bought and maybe Virgil van Dijk. But on the whole, the top four don't tend to do a lot of business in the January transfer window. Tottenham's was a needs must because the narrative is being peddled out that Conte's going to be on his bike if he doesn't get precisely what he wants in January, which I personally think is absolute drivel. I think he'll do his business in September, um, in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, um, yes, in the summer transfer window. <clears throat> and they, they rotated their squad. They got rid of some people that he clearly doesn't want. <clears throat> Deli Ali, about time. Ship him out of, ship him out of Spurs because he's been a waste of time for two years. Shift him over to Everton and see what they can do with him. Um, and, you know, and Dembele has been a problem for the club for some time there was a problem with Mourinho there's now a problem with Conti and a problem with his attitude on the pitch so you look at the players that he signed the boy that he signed from Juventus 150 games two goals you know you'd like to see some more goals coming from from midfields from Spurs because ultimately that's where a lot of their problems are is creativity but I think it's sensible there's a myth about Daniel people perpetuate this myth he's not the best transfer dealing guy in the world he's not the most difficult chairman to deal with when you've got something everyone wants like Gareth Bell it's not difficult to hold your price when you can then get that money look at the transfer dealings 90 million quid that he spent on Gareth Bell money went on rubbish and then you look at, look at Daniel's ability to leave a smaller clubs that's not that's not great dealing that's just the opportunity that you're in if you're in a situation where Tottenham are a bigger club than say Milton Keynes or Tottenham are a bigger club at my time in Crystal Palace you can use that influence to be able to turn people's heads so he's neither a curmudgeon and a, and a, and a, and a, and a chairman that doesn't want to spend money and he's not also not a great deal maker either he's just a football club chairman that people have built up into a myth of as to what he is and what he isn't I think Tottenham's transfer window is okay it's what I expected it to be I expected 20, 30, 40 million pounds of a spend if you've taken 10 or 15, 20 million pounds off the wage bill you can free it up hmm. I mean Conti is these managers I'm more in, interested from, than hearing what the managers have to say rather than the journalists I, you know when you hear about West Ham spend David Moyes if David Moyes is complaining then we need to be listening to West Ham about their, their travails. If Conte is telling everybody that this is a dreadful transfer window, then we listen to those guys. But I think to answer your original question, it's a kind of all right transfer window for Tottenham, isn't it? It's not Tottenham aren't going to sit there and go, geez, Louise, we've made it so exciting, we can't wait to see the next game. Yeah, I mean, we will we hear from the managers this week, but mm. uh, whether you hear with any degree of accuracy uh, as to how they really do feel is another matter. We'll do our best to fill in in the meantime. Well, he's not usually one to hide his emotions, Antonio Conte. And actually, Simon said a couple of days ago, I think you can read more into uh, the, the Tottenham situation come the summer. I think that's when I would expect them to, to really back the manager. But I think the key to their business yesterday was when these rumours started to surface from other media outlets about their interest in Ousmane Dembele. That was quickly stamped out um, by somebody very close to the club that I contacted and they basically said that he's a bad egg and they've just got rid of some of those. So you look at the players that have left the club, that really backs up what Simon was saying about wanting to cleanse the dressing room. The Dembele situation is fascinating because he was linked with Manchester United, with Tottenham. Uh, Chelsea was 99% done, according to uh, one Spanish outlet. I don't think he ever came close uh, to coming to the Premier League. I think we were offered him to host game day uh, on Saturday and we said no. <laughs> and he said to stay put and that's the last thing that he wanted, isn't it? And probably the last thing that Barcelona wanted. And it's an intriguing situation there, isn't it? Because... It's not that long ago that we were told Barcelona were facing financial ruin, uh, didn't have any money to spend. All of a sudden, any minute now, they're going to announce Pierre and Rick Aubameyang. Yes, he's taking a pay cut, but he's not there for 50 quid a week. So it, it does cast the light on Barcelona and where they've suddenly found the pot of cash from. You have to remember that they, what they were asked to do was reduce their wage bill based upon the fact that the La Liga had suggested or stated now that they were reducing the turnover of wages, wages against turnover to 70%. Barcelona had no turnover from the previous year because they'd lost £250 million out of their turnover and they're also having to restructure their debt. They've restructured their debt. They've now got their revenues back coming back in so they are able to take players in and build up their wage bill again, not to the £630 million absurdity that it was before, but certainly you'll see Barcelona being able to spend the kind of money that they are spending and moving back into the territory where the big two Spanish clubs are able to compete with the European giants. Otherwise, they were just going to fall away, weren't they? What does it, what does it tell us, though, Simon, l looking at Arsenal, that Ozil, gone, he was allowed to go. Aubameyang, gone, allowed to go. 
Are we seeing that Arteta says what he means and means what he says? Well, it, it, in this instance, the Ozil situation is like visiting the sins of a father on a pseudo son. He didn't sign that ridiculous contract with Ozil, but he is culpable for the signing of the um, Aubameyang contract. It shows you that there's an immense profligacy at Arsenal at times. They go from one extreme to the other. They go from feast to famine. Right? They go from not wanting to sign players to all of a sudden spend 130 million in the transfer window and giving certain players ridiculous amounts of money that they can't get in 90% of the clubs around the country. They can't even get some of these wages at the clubs that are winning the Premier League. So with those arguments, you find yourself in a situation where you know, you wonder what Arsenal's motivation is. But the Ozil situation had to be resolved. Just someone had to have the balls to take care of it. Unai Emery abdicated responsibility and didn't deal with it. Arteta was always yeah. going to be a new broom because he had no relationship with a player or, or, or really interest in the player. Mm. But Bamiyang is a car crash. It's a car crash for the player. It's a car crash for Arsenal. It's a car crash for the manager. You know, to some is extent, it's a car crash for Bamiyang. Well, it is really. He's sitting in Barcelona. Well, he sits in Barcelona, having to having to climb down or having to walk out of Arsenal Football Club, a club that he captain in almost in the back of a of an embarrassing disgrace. Disgrace is a harsh word, but he's been drop kicked out of the team. This was the guy that everyone was waiting with an egg timer to sign his contract. Oh, true. This was the guy yep. that lit the sky yep. up. He's now gone out of the door, having to accept a massive pay cut to go to Barcelona, who at this stage, whilst they're redeveloping to go to Alex's point, they're not going to dominate Europe as they once did before. They're, they're Barcelona light, mm. aren't they? So you look at it and say, Aubameyang, did he win? I mean, now, now we're going, now we're going to ridicule him, or potentially ridicule him, by saying he's the odd and wengi of his time. He's, he's had the last he's, laugh. Though. He's photo bombed Barcelona into giving him a deal. I mean, what, what's his huge, last laugh? Two, a, ma a massive pay cut. He's, uh, got, he's gone from three hundred and fifty grand a week to possibly sub two hundred. How's how's he had the last laugh? I'm not sure. There's any. Well, how's he going to how's he going to struggle through that? But I know what I know what you mean, but notwithstanding it, he still had to take a seven and a half million pound pay cut. Arsenal would could you, have would, Arsenal could have continued to say, Simon, you sit in the sidelines until we tell you when you're back yeah, in. They, they, that could have lasted they, until May June. They could have done that, and they could have spent another twenty five million pounds proving a point. And sure. I'm, I'm in that camp that sometimes that's worth the money because the amount of money you're going to save there on afterwards by people having their minds concentrated is an unfathomable and an uncalculable amount of money. Yeah, but there's also the fact that he is a media interest. He's not some one of these players that you can park in the resis and just sit there and say, get on with it. He will be on the back pages of the newspaper, where's a Bamiyan? Where's a Bamiyan? Where's a Bamiyan? Mm. Every time they don't score a goal, where's a Bamiyan? Where's a Bamiyan? That's right. So it probably was the lesser of two evils. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. Talk sport.